Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Swing Museum. I'm your host, Jan Everly, and today we are awaiting the arrival of our guests, Harry and Edna. They're coming a long journey, but I think it'll be worth it. I'm looking so forward to catching up with them, hearing about their stories of their radio show, and we've also selected some music uh, for them that they have chosen. So I think it's going to be a... I think I hear them coming now. I'll be right back. I'm so glad that you two made it here safely. I know it was a long journey and the <laughs> flight was the flight was long. <laughs> but we're so so glad to see you. It seems like um I mean it it seems like such a long time that we were first acquainted with um with you at, at WYYR. Yes. That was a long time yeah, ago yeah. now. Uh, yeah, how did you how did you end up contacting Chris Valenny or did he find you? How how did that work? I think I just sent him an email pleading, please give us some airtime. I think that's what started. <laughs> <laughs> I could say it was, it was more, far, more refined than that, but I think it was just pure begging. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I want to start out a little bit with, um, you know, where you all are from. Um, you know, I, I know you probably, well, you might have grown up in the same town, but where are you from? Edna? I'm originally from God's County called Yorkshire. So every now and again, I say things like uh, no, and uh, up and Kirka Curla and, and stuff like and that. Bath, bath. And so it's, um, but I've, you've managed to drag it out of me. I've made you more southern. More southern, yes. <laughs> However, you. Uh, so my dad was in the RAF, uh, Royal Air Force, and I. My sister was born in Gibraltar, and I was born in what was West Berlin. Oh. So when it was uh, sort of shared out still. Um, yeah, and I was born in a British Horses Hospital in, in Germany, in West Berlin. So my parents settled back over in the UK uh, when my dad came out of the forces, uh, toured around a bit as they do when people come out of the services and then settled in the new town of Milton Keynes in Buckinghamshire. Which, yeah, pretty much centre of the country. Yeah, we couldn't get more landlocked, could we? <laughs> Uh, and that's where we met. Well, we met through uh, reenacting uh, and our love, shared love of history. Yes. Oh, you, that's me. Yeah, that's I, I was going to hand the story over oh, to you. I was going to say, no, it's, it, we, we met back in, um, I think it was 1651, during the English Civil War. Um, and then we became time tarts and flitted around various centuries until settling in our beloved 1940s. So, yeah, we originally sat doing living history based around. Um, uh, the English Civil War period, yeah, which is Charles I. 1650s ish, ish, depending on which war you're actually fighting at that time. But I'll, I'll, bet, I'll bet there was, I'll bet there was an interesting conversation when you met at, as reenactors as to how each of you ended up there, because that's not something that a lot of people do. I'm acquainted with a few people who do do that 30s, 40s era, and they just, they don't forget dates, they don't forget. Uh, re things to remember, important people of the, but they, it's just such a beautiful thing to watch. Were you surprised um, to meet through through that? Because it's not something that, you know, everybody in the world does. I, I was surprised because it was my hobby and there isn't an awful lot of ladies taking <laughs> in that hobby. So it's kind of thing just what you do because you enjoyed it and I never expected to meet my future wife group. No. Particularly as um, we were on opposite sides. Yeah. And so you portrayed a gentleman in, in the cavalry, and uh, I was on the foot soldiers. And in this is the days before we had the health and safety legislation we have today. And I used to specialise in pulling the cavalry off the horses. Yeah, which hurts. And I pulled, and I pulled her off. <laughs> it hurts when you come off in armour. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hit the ground. Yeah. So did, 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 you <clears throat> did you decide from then <clears throat> that you would only be participating together in doing them or did you still do separate reenactions? We, we did, we always went to the same battle, so there was always a reenactment of a specific battle across the country, uh, like, um, and a lot of, quite a few of them were on the original battlefields that historically they would have happened. Um, I started off as a royalist, which was where Harry's kind of regiment was, uh, 
but I, I've always ridden and I loved horses. So I turncoated, it's called, and I went and, and joined the opposition parliament. Uh, and it was just interesting going up against your own regiment because their main aim was to get you off the horse. So sort of the, the trying to do the, the fighting went out the window a bit and it was a bit more sort of personal between uh, the fighting that was going on. But it, it, the adrenaline, you can't explain the adrenaline of, of reenacting a full scale battle. It's, it's incredible. But you're also not trying to hurt each other. No, you're not. No, no. So we, you know, we all yeah. have to go to work in the morning. So. Yeah, we, a bit bruised, but you're still going. <laughs> the whole idea was not to put each other in hospital. No, no. Yeah, that would be sort of hard to explain. People would say, where did you get that black eye, Edna? You know? Oh, yeah. yeah, they'd <laughs> often expect us in partly broken on a Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. Did you do the reenactments at Twinwood as well? We, we, we sort so. of, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Because I mean, how it went, we we're in the 17th century. Um, then we decided to, well, I decided to leap forward to my true passion, which is sort of the Edwardian Great War era. You came with me, then you decided you wanted the boat. And yeah. so that pushed us <laughs> on into the 40s era. I was a content <laughs> to peel spuds, which was my role as a woman. <laughs> I don't I'd know if you say from, spots, you know, no, potatoes, potatoes. potatoes. So I'd come from, you know, adrenaline fueled battle reenactment to peeling potatoes and making food for the troops <laughs> and that, that, that didn't quite float my boat anymore. You know, I wasn't that interested. <laughs> but then, um, and then we sort of sat, uh, 
found a group that did World War II reenactment, home, home front. front side. That's sort of where our passion is, is the social history side of things. And um, we knew a number of friends that then were at Twinwoods and invited us to go along uh, and do some battle scenarios with them and sit in their encampments. And that's sort of... We drank a lot of tea. I remember yeah. that. A lot of tea. <laughs> And and um, spam sandwiches. Spam sandwiches. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thanks for sending that over, by the way. It's very handy. <laughs> I I um I tell you, I found Twinwood to be fascinating. It was much more than I thought it would be. I mean, it was it was everything and more. And um, I enjoyed just walking through those backwoods. You know what I mean? Once you yeah. leave the stage area, toward you're heading toward the old uh, airfield. You know, back yeah. where that building is. And um, watching the reenactors, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, I just thought to myself, this is just really puts the cherry on top of really getting the feel. You're listening to the music, you're in the place where it all took place. And then there's reenactors. And I just felt like I didn't want to leave. I didn't want the weekend to end. It was just fascinating. Now the crew chiefs and shoo shoo baby. <laughs> very first one which I think was 2000 or 2001 and we've attended I think every single one since yeah and uh, it's certainly grown so when it first started it was literally a, a um, farm trailer with a step ladder <laughs> and they used to you know, and the acts used to go onto the farm trailer and perform what was then a field and then they built the amphitheater later and things like that and it was the Glen Miller tribute Festival, Originally, it? It was yeah. a Miller right. Festival. I was going to say that. I recall um, a friend of mine who was with the original gentleman, I guess, who had the brainstorm of putting this together. And it was originally supposed to be all about Miller. But I'll tell you, I think you can go only so far with that because you want to draw people and you want to share it. So they ended up opening it up and putting the dance floor thing out there and 
and everything. Yeah. And I, I, I was just all for it. it. Didn't have to be all about Miller for sure. There was enough Miller Millerites there who just <laughs> loved the feeling of being there and knowing that Glenn had been there. And, and then they flew the planes over. So it was pretty amazing, I have to say. Yeah, I, I always found that, um, that those that go there and reenact want to get it absolutely right. So their authenticity is, is absolutely 100%. They'll go to the length to make sure their, their socks are right, their hats, the hairstyles are right, the bags are right, you know, everything. All the detail is 100% sort of historically accurate. It's certainly the groups that, that we were with and, and have met there and it's, um, you know, looky likey or as near as can be isn't right it has to be absolutely 100 percent. not always original um but you get some really good reproductions now that you, you wouldn't be able to spot the difference and, and then you as you know you can turn up at the festival not knowing anything and dress yourself get your hair done there so you can immerse yourself in the whole experience which i think is really amazing mm, that would be very very true yeah i was very impressed with twin wood and i and i missed the last time i was there was with john miller's orchestra in 2007 and i didn't realize how big the stage really was when they played my intro and i walked out i went i have to hurry <laughs> I have to run. <laughs> you know? So it was amazing. I would love the opportunity to go back again to uh, traveling overseas for the next, uh, you know, time or a year or two is going to be very difficult. Michigan water tastes like cherry wine. gears I could talk all day about reenacting <laughs> I love I love it if I had the time I would love to be involved in that so what you were so you spent a lot of time in that world when did you really decide that 
the music from uh, you know the 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 age of new radio, which was 1930s. When did you really start to go, hey, let's have a radio show or let's broadcast something? When when did that come in? It came just by chance. We were asked to appear on a, a, a local radio show where we lived because we were classed as those weird people that live in the street who dress in old clothes. And before we actually got to the interview, they get said, "Did you want your own program?" And that's how it started originally. I think we did. Uh, the... We did a six. We had a six-week contract. That's right. Yeah. Which we still got now. Yeah. <laughs> which is must be about, so many years later. Yeah, more than a long, decade. long six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> They've never actually sent us another contract. We've they're, still got the original they're, they're, one. Just go with the flow. We just go with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how it started. And then, and then I think because there's a, it's a really big scene over in the UK. It, trying to we we always worried that we'd run out of content or we'd we'd sort of run out of, of yeah content for the show yeah. but it's as, as the years that we've done it we've always found more and more people it, it diversifies there's new events that we can cover uh and it's just gone from strength to strength and, and it's really bizarre and, and uh, you probably get this yourself when you go to events and to places and people recognize you or, or know who you are and that, that that's quite strange for us. Well, it was for us. We developed a whole series of questions to try and work out if we actually did know them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're really glad that you did. So, so you, so you, you entered into this happenstance and you were really enjoying it. And so what did you really think at some point was going to happen? Um, like for instance, I know Harry that you've got gramophone Harry now, uh, Ray and I checked it out a couple of weeks ago and it's awesome. I mean, you guys do a wonderful job on both, but when did you really, I mean, I know it, it's, it's got to be, still be sort of far back there. When did you really think, you know, radio, I mean, we could, we could really do this and, and keep this going and reach a lot of people. Um, that's sort of scary. It was for me when I first did it years ago. I guess I'm going to show my age because I was born back in 1900 and okay, but back in the 80s, I had this vision of being a, a radio presenter so i had done radio long ago this is in the days of reel-to-reel -reel tapes and seven you know and proper shellac radio and records and not a computer in sight so i had a little bit of experience so when we were offered did we want to do it i knew how to run a mixing desk for example so we were able to do that um and i just like i actually like radio as a medium we don't we're not big te te television watchers to be honest mm. but we're really um addicted to radio well you've moved like you've gone forward don't you you're addicted to podcasts yeah, but, yeah. Uh, um i'm particularly just yes, I, I, uh, I think it's the music we've always loved the music Be, being immersed in the scene through reenactment the music's been around us all the time wherever you go to events it's you know there's always music on um i i, I guess because i started doing when I, we did the reenacting i started to go on and do talks to um, our WI groups, they're called Women's Institute, something that came out of the Second World War, still going around today. Uh, so I talked to historical groups, WIs, all sorts of groups. So I, I, was, I was used to talking to complete strangers <laughs> and striking up conversations. So, so it sort of was natural that I did the interviewing and you did the, the technical side. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, when you first start out, we were very intimidated by people listening to us talking and, and when you're doing it live you, you do become very conscious of, of all your mistakes and not getting things right uh, vocally um, but I think the more we've done it the more we've just settled into it the way it's natural now and because we're a couple there's that natural mm -hmm. rapport <laughs> that we have. And I <laughs> Ray and I are the same yeah Ray it's the same with Ray and I in fact I did like I say I do you know all the radio and the interviewing and he does the production I mean it's um, it's really amazing we uh, we we both find the same enjoyment out of the era. I think when I met Ray um, years ago, uh, he really got hooked on the era too, and uh, the history and um, his his late father-in-law and all of the music uh, from Miller. So that really helps, and and it helps the understanding with the other person instead of going, "What are you doing?" You know. <laughs> so it really does help quite a bit to have a rapport in that way.
my heart go boom. Me and my heart go boom, boom, pretty boom, all together. Boom, when you are near, it's boom. You disappear and boom, boom, pretty boom, stormy weather. Dawn's early light and the still of the night give a boom at the sight of a wonder. Like Mandalay, now the dawn of the day, it comes up with a boom like thunder. Boom, one little look and boom. Me and my heart go boom, boom, pretty boom, all together. If you really had to do something that showcased your love for reenactment, your love for 1930s radio, um, what would that be? It would be boring for anyone to watch, but I would love to be on the set of Jeeves and Worcester. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be uh, Bertie Worcester. I'm far too old, and I'm not from that class. And it would be boring to watch, but I would love that. We've done, um, because our, our house used to be, we decorated it into the style of 1930s and uh, a little bit of 40s. So we used to get asked to do quite a bit of filming. And um, there was an exhibition on in London. It was called the 1940s house, where they'd taken this family and moved them back into the, the sort of done up this house back into how it would have been in 1939. And we visited it and we would have quite happily just shut the door. <laughs> And just oh really? Moved into the house. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so I think that sums us up. We yeah. we we're kind of we would we'd quite happily go back um to the, that era, I think, and probably cherry pick all the nice bits because we have that that benefit of hindsight and health and public health systems. Ricketts, diphtheria and Hitler wasn't a great No, we would we'll right. take them bits we're, out. We're <laughs> I'll tell you, you uh, know what you know what I would really see for you would be a mini documentary i mean of following in by by combining your love and your talent for reenacting along with the music you could really yeah. really host your own mini doc and have it love i mean it would be you have the passion for it and the talent for it absolutely without a doubt but i think you'd really love it yeah you'd get I, 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 I would love it yes so, I'm sure we've we got um, three children now who, who We've always, we, we were doing this before we, we, we had children, and um, I don't know what they would take to it. I'm still trying to buy our daughter away from Netflix during lockdown. So, you know. <laughs> but they grew up with it, so, and it's quite interesting. That they, they did grow up with it, so we had the big old Marmette pram, uh, and they were all babies in this big old-fashioned pram. They had all the wooden toys. They dressed in the old original clothing. Um, and they discovered Xbox and that was it. Well, yeah. they, they, so they would come away for the weekends with us. It was lovely because they got back to being children as in, you know, picking up all sorts and, you know, mucky knees and dirty faces and, and they loved it. And the, you get to a point where they do move away from it. But our, our eldest is now coming. She's, she's like vintage shops. We have a lot of vintage shops in the UK. So she likes going around. She's collecting vinyl now. She's into her music, so I think she's sort of coming round to 
Yeah, but what she calls vintage is different. Yeah. She thinks anything from the 80s, 90s is vintage. Yeah, well, she's, yeah. she's, 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 straight, she's raided my wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> this is my homage to the 90s, this wardrobe. She's got an original Beach Boys vinyl, she's quite chuffed with. So. Yeah. But yeah, a bit too modern for us. <laughs> yeah, well, at, at some point, 30, 30 years down the road, it probably will be considered vintage, but, you know, yeah. probably a little <laughs> early for that. <laughs> so... It, personal taste of music. I mean, I know that you're talking about um, playing what you play when you're on air and on the wireless and um, Harry, uh, where you select your music from. Is it your personal stuff? Do you... Um... Well, my grand... So my father was very much into that, that sort of period of music. So we have a lot of his collection. If I had a choice, and I haven't got a huge amount, I'm not saying a huge amount, probably yeah. less than about 30 or 40 tracks, um, it's sort of the, the, the British scene from the 30s, because in those periods, um, the America and Britain was really quite quite different in its musical taste, I guess, because of the, the distance and communication. And you have some weird, what we think is weird songs, like I bought my girlfriend a watermelon last night, and I watched a fly climb up the window, and these sort of like, almost like jollity songs, really, and I like those, because I love the clever use of lyrics. And you have to really listen to what they say. So I like those kind of songs. And oh, well, yeah. Like, That's when you can understand lyrics. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. and the other thing is, um, I think a lot of the composers during that period of time uh, wrote a lot of um, verses before the actual song. And people today, when you hear somebody redo a song like that and they use the verse, they have no idea what song, what song it is because there were so many people between that period who just went out and recorded the song without the beauty of the, you know, the verse in there. I think that was big in the thirties and forties. Yeah. And it was a lot of the music and songs were about fun, weren't they? As well as you were talking about jollity, it's, they were just having fun. There was no, you didn't have to kind of produce an output or sell so many millions of records to keep you, you know, some of them were just pure fun and silliness and, and 
you know, we, we like to play some of those in the again, don't we, in the yeah. show. A lot of them you can't play for. Um, because there's some yeah, rude the, words the, in there. There's words which, um, not saying rude, the sense, but, but the sense of it, you know, the... Um, it's just changed. The meaning's changed over time, time and, and it wasn't offensive back then and, and no. people might offense to it now. No, if you, if you were saying, you know, to somebody back in the 1930s, how was that birthday party? Oh, we had a gay time. Yeah, that was yeah. just absolutely uh, the description because that is the real definition of gay yeah. is wonderful. It's just, yeah. and so it, it's people use words differently and they, they put whatever meaning later on, but yeah. that was the lingo then. And sometimes I even find myself saying, you know, geez, I've, I've had a gay time, you know, it's just yeah. one of those things that sort of dates you a little bit, but um, yeah. Yeah. So what what do you what what are your next projects? I mean, do you have any something really sitting in? Do you have any interviews? Do you have what? I, and I know you're busy with your family too and work. Uh, I really like from the Harry and on the wireless side. I'd really like to be more disciplined and actually getting the podcast out rather than once a month, which is a massive for lucky. Um, I would like to do that. However, you can't really see behind it. It's dark. But uh, we're just coming out of lockdown and we have an old Victorian house which is on this, well it was falling down, it's more or less staying up now. <laughs> um, you have a long list and then you found another house that's even more yeah, in a bad state so, than this one yeah. and you are tempted to buy that one. So I found a house that was built in 1884 mm -hmm. and it's kind of got holes in the roof. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> the barge boards have fell the off. The barge board, yeah. And there's, um, there's a, it's got dry rot, wet rocks. Yeah. Woodworm. And I said, Harry, wow, that would be such a fun so project. I think that's the next. <laughs> so we're talking about buying that. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll keep us off. Do you all, well, do you all have um, what, what, what we call in the States um, a historic registry? So if it's a certain number of years old, it falls under the antique registry and then... We do. Um, yeah, and then you can't change when you can't add things to it yeah. that don't belong in the original thing. You can redo them, but you just can't change the original integrity, I guess, of the of the homestead. Yeah. And what would you do with that? <laughs> if, would you, we, yeah, we, on, in the UK, we have the... So they're listed buildings. So they, they have a listed, they're grade two listed, three listed, one listed. And that... that is the variance of how much you can tinker about with them and not destroy the historic fabric. It was made famous by Queen Victoria when she moved over here with her summer residence, her summer palace on the island. Um, so there's a lot of really beautiful Victorian houses over here. So they're not as special, you see what I mean, because they're everywhere and there's such incredible detailing and architectural style that we're lucky really. So we've had such joy doing this one up. <laughs> Victorian the homes, one, they're, they're really large. I yeah. mean, they, they really, really are big. But by modern standards, yeah, because yeah. we, you know, we've lived in modern houses and they're very, well, in the UK, they're very tiny, maximum up the building plot. And we don't have that, although we, um, we found the old deeds for this house. I think the original, it was something like three, we got, three. do you have acres in, in I don't know if you do have acres, it's, but it's, it's a unit of size. Um, yes, land it, it was a big plot, but that's all been sold off over the time, so we only have a small area of the backyard now because all the rest of the houses on. But originally, that was huge. Yeah. So, yeah, so apart from podcasts, we're missing events as well. So, because of the, the year of sort of lockdown, all the events have been cancelled. That, that's what we're missing, and we're looking forward to getting back out there and getting back in amongst the live music because I'm sure you appreciate you can't be live live big band sounds are just amazing so yeah really i mean yeah it really is <clears throat> i just talked to nick hilscher last week and they had not worked since i think it was maybe the second week in march mm -hmm. and so that's the longest that the miller band has gone without without working you know yeah. so um last week they did drive up <clears throat> pardon me to i think it was indiana there was one gig up there and it was um i think he was glad to be back at doing it it was just the one but you know people were wearing masks and they were every so many seats you could only occupy so it was about half full total but it's just sort of a stark remember you know to, reminder of what we're really going through but i'll tell you something that dawned on me the other day when i was doing the promo and I was talking about radio in the, in the sense that 
back then it was virtual it was it was a virtual reality say you were like here in this in this country we would um have you know baseball games that were broadcast on the radio and so you have nothing visual but suddenly your mind starts taking over and you start seeing it in a virtual way and i said to ray you know the the golden age of radio in the 1930s hasn't changed it's still virtual we're bringing things i mean we're bringing ourselves so people can see us which is nicer but really it really is is just virtual reality you have to use your imagination don't you agree mm. yeah absolutely it was a a comedy show called the Goonie show in the 1950s which uh, featured some of the great comedians at the time and had never been able to recreate it on television or film simply because it was it relied on the power of your imagination it was set it was a very surreal very very silly sort of sketches but they could never create those in reality but with a few sound effects and, uh, and some silly voices you could do it so i get it yeah your imagination can create a far better scene than uh, yeah than steven spielberg yeah, and that's why I always love the spoken word and I, I love the imagination that people, in, when they try and paint pictures for you, you just, your imagination kicks in and um, I, I just think it's, I'm so glad in a way we're going back to it and certainly a lot of our friends that are artists over this period have had to come up with really creative ways of reaching out to their audiences so they don't lose their followings and their audiences in, in really creative ways. I know it's some of it's through YouTube, but it's also sort of trying to do things so very differently uh, and more creatively. That's, I think for some of them, they, it was a challenge to begin with, but they've actually then enjoyed being able to just be as creative as they want um, and come up with some fantastic ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it does, some things will never ever change. And as long as there's radio, it will always be the original virtual uh you know thing for your mind <clears throat> i mean that's really um i think people were excited when tv came on the air you know the, the whatever it was that they played in the very earliest earliest of, of uh, days but um i think at some point when you go back to radio you're never disappointed no no not at all and, and um i think people were had a much better use of language as well because you're trying to be so much more descriptive and, and trying to sum up pictures in people's minds that the way people presented back then was very different as well because it's trying to engage you and draw you into into their world both musically and vocally absolutely Sorry, i agree just, I was <laughs> you just was lost of, in mind no, no, what i was no, saying no, 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 <laughs> i'd actually thinking of a completely off the, off the um, tangent anecdote side but it was so weird i thought it would take longer to explain than the acts <laughs> at the end of it so <laughs> with you heart and soul the way a fool would do madly because you held me tight and stole a kiss in a night heart and soul i beg to be adored lost control and tumbled overboard night we kiss there in the moonlight ah oh, but your lips were thrilling much too Oh, held all my heart. 
heart and Would you ever consider doing Gramophone Harry with the video? Um, um, you know, since I, it's. I, I would love. I mean, the, the, the whole thing about about what we're doing. You know, I want. I don't know about Gramophone Harry because you're talking about that. Gramophone Harry came about because there was a request from various stations to do more music based and less talk. Um, right. To be brutally honest, we like the, the chit chat, yeah. and, and that also helped us because it did the podcast as well because without. Then, because of podcasting, you know, licensing, you can't use the music. Um, I'd love to do a bit, a bit of video work, but because it's how do you get your product out, and um, you know, the online video services seems to be the most popular way of doing it. But uh, you do it on stage, though, don't you? You've done the gramophone, Harry, on stage. Done it at Twinwood. Yes. <laughs> done it at Twinwood a few times. Um, and that's quite visually entertaining as well, with you trying to wind up your gramophone before, because uh, you've not wound it up enough. The track so that's actually a gag in it. Yeah. You always make sure it runs out halfway through. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's that's your audience that really understands it. So you know you're not looking at somebody and they're looking back at you like you're speaking a whole different language. Literally, you know they expect that and they probably revere and wish it would not stop. You know that you could go yeah. on and on with it. So it is it is fascinating. And even if you're in person and you're doing a radio presentation or, or like you say, a reenactment, there is still something that takes you back to another place and it really makes it a timeless situation, which is, yeah, what I love. I mean, playing the gramophone on the, on, on the stage, that just came about because we used to run a, a vintage theme night in, in, in a theatre. And, uh, and, and whenever you do these sort of events by yourself, you have to think of ways how to keep the costs down. And it was, I couldn't afford a, a warmer pack, so we had to create our own to be the warmer pack. And that's what it was. While, you know, while people are, are finding their seats and getting their drinks and getting comfortable for the night, you have to have something on stage. So, well, we'd the gramophone Harry was um, nice. I was nice. just going to say, to put it in context, we'd recreated a 1930s nightclub. Um, so, the idea is that you were entertained, you rather know, than rather than jiggy jaggy dancing. Yeah, dancing. Um, so, it was literally the opening act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we did some great uh, party <laughs> dances. 30s, 1930s, social dancing. They, they were, mm. especially after people had had a couple of drinks, but they were quite entertaining. But, <laughs> but certainly the opening act for the nightclub. That, that that's, that's, how how start, that's how that started. The stage thing. Yeah, I doing, I really realistically do it for a couple of festivals. Twinwood's been one of them. Uh, because, to be honest, you can only do it for so long before it gets boring. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so many times I can let the microphone mind down. And run across <laughs> and do the comedic bit. 
<laughs> do you do you have a, a gramophone collection, you know, or is a personal collection or? We've only got three. So is that, that's like a mini collection, we have three. Yeah, you shop. can't see you can't them, see they're on the shelf. Over there behind yeah. me. Um, but yes, um, we have a trench radio, which is our favourite one, and then a couple of... Um, which is literally an original First World War trench, trench, trench radio. Gramophone. Trench, yeah. Yeah. And then a, a couple, one with a big horn on it, you know, and that sort of thing. But uh, I, I am, we, ha we have a problem with collections, we have too many of them, and we have to be very um, brutal as to how many things we have. If I could yeah. collect yeah, re now, records, collect records was my was my problem. I I when I was record collecting records back in the uh, late seventies, early eighties, when I first started singing with the Vincent Lopez Junior Orchestra, I really got hooked on collecting, and I I amassed some I don't know twelve or fifteen hundred albums. Wow. And so, if you've ever had to move with these in boxes, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a it's a start up for a bad argument. You know, like what are you yeah. doing with those? How come? You, I mean, I I had to cut down at some point, but um, I used them when I first did radio as well, and I was behind the big pill mic like you were, Harry, and uh, with the turntables and the you know, tape machines, the cart machines, and the knobs, and uh, so it did make it difficult for me to transition to using you know the mouse becomes your your you know your um your arm for the turntable and your music library inside the computer becomes your series of albums it was a hard transition ray was the one that really helped me try to wrap my brain around it it was hard but i love doing traditional radio although when you ever are djing at a festival you know you're now you've got to take your laptop and you plug it in and I've got my entire music collection there. Yeah. So we have all flight, ca you know, flight cases, cases of, up and down stairs. Of shellac, <laughs> you know, and you know shellac, just, Snaps. you can break it so easily. Uh, and I think at the last Twin Woods, because it was, so, it was a heat wave, oh. so you had to find a freezer or somewhere really cold to put your records in because they were just going to melt otherwise. <laughs> and what was it, what would you consider a heat wave for Twin Wood? Um, did it? It, it's nearly a hundred yeah oh, I mean, wow. your camping is is not fun <laughs> oh huh. the the two times i went it didn't break maybe 70. yeah yeah no, huh. just in the last sort of four or five years the weather's gone crazy and it's that, like, uh, that is we've a just had a, we've just had a storm here you know and, and we don't get storm storm season's usually october so yeah. Wow. yeah i was not expecting a storm to be it's, it's yeah. only just literally ended about two hours ago but mm -hmm. as you know, at Twinwood, Twinwood, sorry, being an airfield is always, always windy, hence they, why they built it there. But I think even, it wasn't, that it wasn't even windy. <laughs> we were relying on the wind, but it didn't come, did it? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to, um, you know, let you know that we've, we've gotten your selection of music and um, we're so happy that you allowed, are allowing us to play it during the interview. Uh, we have one or two little tidbits of our own, and it's been so enjoyable to just sit and talk about things that we both love, which is radio in the era, and uh, long live the era. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I always kept thinking this vintage scene revival one day would die off, but it's been about 20 years, so maybe not. Yeah. It's here to stay. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I think that's probably something that won't be going away at all. It'll be there as long as we're there to keep it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you just need to work on your daughter in that uh, vintage thing. Yeah, 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 yeah bring yeah. that down three or four decades. <laughs> yeah. Nirvana, no, no, no. 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 <laughs> A bit more ink spots. Yeah, yeah she like does that. actually. She likes the ink spots, so <laughs> she's getting there. <laughs> oh, really? What is it? I wonder what it is about the ink spots that she loves. I have no idea because I was surprised when she came back with the album from, from, the, from the thrift store. She found one there. And it's like ink spots. But she always does. I mean, she came with Jefferson Airplane, was it, yeah. the other day? Yeah. Oh, that's really? not nothing here. It no, comes from work out. Well, where did you even hear them? We dabble in the 50s, and that's about as, 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 modern, as, as we modern as we get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Well, I wish you both the very best. Um, we'll need to stay in touch. You guys yeah. are you guys are amazing. I'm so happy that you have evolved and are under the um, the Dan White wing. It's a great place to be. He's got a lot of support for 
his hosts. Right. And uh, we can't ask for anything more than that. He really is a great guy. And I really appreciate you being with us uh, today at the Swing Museum. And uh, we'll be talking to you very, very soon and be in touch and be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Heaven must have sent her my way Skies above me Never were as blue as her eyes And if she loves me Who could want a sweeter surprise When she nestles in my arms so tenderly there's a thrill that words cannot express In my heart a song of love is taunting me Melody haunting me Sweet and lovely Sweeter than the roses in May And as she loves me there is nothing more I can say.